Hello, welcome to the Paradigm Shift, episode 71, Insecurity, the Motive of False Appearances. I'm Apostle Matthew Shoemaker. Fear-based thinking could be summarized basically as insecurity, in a word. Rather than looking to man's opinion of us, we should value what God thinks about us over anything else. Insecurity comes into our heart when we value the opinion of man more greatly than we value than we evaluate God's thoughts. God knows the truth. <laughs> what we need to change about our lives, God knows. And things that we have inside of us that God put there, God knows why they're there because he put them there. So what man thinks about you is of no consequence. The false appearances of your life or the fronts that we put up to try to make things look different than they really are, <laughs> they don't change anything about what's really on the inside. That's what God is looking at. He's looking at your heart. Now that's kind of a, a uh, title that might be a little bit confusing, so let me explain. Insecurity the motive of false appearances. So what does that mean? What that means is when you put up a front, a facade. Now, most uh, religious practice in Christianity right now is people putting up a religious facade. What's that mean? That means trying to make things look good to everybody that's watching them, all the people. And so it's an exterior thing it's what men can see that people are paying attention to and they are trying to maintain the image that they're projecting. You see, they're putting up a facade on their house. This is a spiritual house. <laughs> they're trying to make their life look good. But see, God chose David because David had something on the inside of his heart that man couldn't see. That's what God's looking at. And so when we try to put up these fronts, these religious facades, it's because we're insecure on the inside. When we let God rule our hearts and we have all of our dependency on Him, when we evaluate ourselves according to what He thinks rather than what the ideas that we come up with as people, or the ideas that other human beings looking at us come up with, when we value what God thinks about us and says about us above all else, then you're secure. You see, what causes people to try to put up a false front or try to project a certain image to everybody that's watching them is insecurity. And so that's what that means. Insecurity motivates false appearances. You see, and some people would say, well, that's not a false appearance, that's the truth. No, you don't understand. What men see on the outside is of little consequence. God has set eternity within the heart of man. So what matters the most for all eternity is what's on the inside. All of the other stuff, it's just a facade. It's just what men see. God's looking right here. This is what He values. What you look like on the inside of your house. <laughs> you see, a, a physical house and a spiritual house. What do I mean by putting up a religious facade? Okay, if we're a spiritual house and the Holy Spirit's living in us, what we're thinking about, if you're walking around thinking, oh, what's she think about me? What's he think about me? What do they say about me? Then what you're worried about is the outward appearance rather than inward reality. You're putting up a front. You are trying to project an image to everybody that's looking at you because you're concerned with what they think about you. You see? That's when you're valuing the opinion of man over God. It doesn't matter what people think about you, good or bad. If God thinks you've got things screwed up in your life, then you're screwed up. <laughs> if God thinks you've got things straight in your life, then you've got it straight. 
it doesn't matter if every human being on the planet thinks you're absolutely out of your mind. The moment that you pass into eternity, every opinion that man's ever had about you will matter nothing. Nothing. The only thing that will matter is what God thinks about you, how God evaluates your life. That'll be it. And so, <laughs> what God is doing right now, He's trying to get us to stop paying attention to man. Man's always got man's ideas. But, let me explain something. Man doesn't have a clue what's going on. If man does not get their thinking from God, then what they're doing is they're operating in confusion. They think they know, but they don't. If the creator of the universe has an idea and man's idea conflicts with that in any way, guess who's right? <laughs> it's God 100% of the time. He knows everything there is to know. He's perfect. So man has to bring their thoughts, mankind's thoughts, need to align with God's. We're the one that needs to change what we think. <laughs> so, when you're a person that's serving God or you're a Christian that's trying to walk out the Christian life, don't be concerned with the facade or outward appearance of your life. Now, let's talk about a physical house <laughs> for a minute. Have you ever seen a house that was built a certain way and then they use bricks to put on the front of it. <laughs> it wasn't really a house made of brick. It's just a facade they're putting to try to make it look better. Now you do that with a physical house, that's fine. Who cares? It's a physical house. But I'm talking about learning something from what we can see and applying it to our spirit our hearts, the house of the Spirit. So, if you really are living your life for the Lord and you've got the Holy Spirit living in your heart, then what men see is of very little consequence. The Holy Spirit's paying attention to your inward furnishings. What your house looks like on the inside is what matters. It doesn't matter if people look at you and see a magnificent mansion. If they were to open the door and walk in and look inside your heart and it looks like a train wreck, that's what the Holy Spirit's evaluating, what you look like on the inside. And so what happens is when we become concerned with people's opinions about us, what do they see in me? Do they like me? What do they think about me? Do they like my hair? Do they like this? Do they like the way I preach today? Do they like the way I sang my song today? Do they see and think about me? Think, oh, they don't have a very good job. They're not very smart. Oh, her hair's ugly. And I'm talking about little, simple, rudimentary things. But you know what? People evaluate other people according to those uh, shallow evaluations all the time. They're constantly comparing themselves to other people's income levels. They're comparing, oh, this is the house that I own to this person's house. Oh, my kids compared to their kids. And it's so shallow. It's a facade. It's not deep. They're not seeing what's on the inside. They're looking at outward appearance. And we're constantly evaluating according to uh, those metrics. And God doesn't even care. He's looking at the inside of your house. And so as Christians, we need to get our identity from who God is in us. When our Creator 
comes and lives in our heart, who our Creator says we are is who we are. We need to learn to take comfort in the Comforter. <laughs> you see, who the Holy Spirit says we are, that's who we are. And who man says we are, when it aligns with God, then they're right. When it doesn't, their opinion is of absolutely no consequence. None. So let's talk about insecurity. When we start worrying about what other people see when they're looking at us. This happened to Adam and Eve. And when we get insecurity in our hearts and we start valuing the opinions of others, we've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and it's taken root in our heart. Now this is Genesis 3-7 NIV. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Genesis 3-7 NIV. Okay, that's Adam and Eve. And the context of that is that was the moment immediately after they had eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were told not to do, but they did. They sinned. God had an idea, and they said, no, I've got a better idea. God said this, but let me do what I think. And so they ate from uh, the word <laughs> that was not God's word. And it caused them to think differently. And so the moment that change happened on the inside of their hearts, the way they thought changed. And so you know what they did? They began looking at themselves because they were insecure. They started worrying about what other people thought about them. Adam was looking at Eve and thinking, what does she see when she looks at me? And Eve was looking at Adam thinking, what does he see when he looks at me? That's why they covered their flesh up. You see? Because they didn't want the other person to see. So they took a false covering and covered their flesh. They put a facade up. It didn't do any good. It wasn't the covering that God gave them. They became insecure and started worrying about the opinion of the other person looking at them. Insecurity comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are what you are. You are what your Creator created you to be. And what other people think of you has no consequence. You are what you are by the hand of the Almighty. And when people think negative things about you, especially negative things that aren't of character, they're not looking at the inside, they're looking at the outside. When they start to insult and think negatively about the things that they see when they're looking at you, they're insulting the work of the Almighty. It's what they're doing. And so insecurity in our hearts has to be expelled because it's the seed of the enemy. That's the fruit that we shouldn't eat. <laughs> and so, to destroy the work of insecurity, you go all the way back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is fear-based thinking when you're insecure, it's because you fear what other people think about you. It's fear-based thinking. When you start thinking about what would Cindy Lou say, oh, this person's gossiping about me. Oh, this person has a negative opinion about me. And yeah, they do. They do have a negative opinion about the people that serve God. So what? What? Don't eat that fruit. <laughs> you see, the tree of life, 
What? <laughs> That's the tree that we should be eating from. What does God say about your life? What's God say about your purpose on this planet? What does God think about who you are? That's the word of truth. That's the tree of life, you see. Notice that Adam and Eve <laughs> had to look down to notice they were naked. <laughs> you have a low perspective when you do that. It's not the perspective of God. You see, embarrassment comes when you're listening to the voice of the enemy. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a seed that he plants in you that tries to, uh, that he wants to develop into a whole system of thinking. Like a tree, it's fear-based, and then it goes out and branches out into all these different thoughts, lines of thinking, <laughs> lines of reasoning, like a tree. And then it produces fruit. You see? And so, when we're embarrassed, we've been eating from the wrong tree. Do you know that's what Adam and Eve were trying to cover up? Embarrassment. They were bare-assed, and they were trying to cover it up because <laughs> they were embarrassed about what the other person saw. Embarrassment comes when you've been listening to the wrong voice. And so, when you evaluate the opinions of men and start paying attention to them, that's when you become embarrassed. Now, what I want to tell you is embarrassment is a tool of the enemy, the enemy of your soul. And this is in the Word of God. Many times, in fact. But here's an example. There was a situation where David, which David means beloved, and so God loved David. And there was a situation where David was going to take over a territory. And there were a bunch of precursors to this, and this happened many times when God wanted a territory that his people, he wanted his people to rule it, and it was occupied <laughs> by another people group that didn't honor God. And so, <laughs> David begins to come up with a plan. And he sends his mighty men ahead of him to a king. This is in Samuel 10. And 2 Samuel 10. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 10. And when his mighty men get there, this king to this territory that David wants, but David's being nice to this man first. He comes with his mighty men. David sends them out bearing gifts to give to the king. And what, <laughs> what David's doing, <laughs> he is going to allow this foreign king's character to come out. And so he sends his mighty men with a gift. <laughs> and of course, the foreign king that doesn't worship the Most High God, his character does come out. And he purposefully embarrasses the people that David sent to him, the mighty men. And what happens is, is the foreign king that's holding a territory, <laughs> ruling there, he takes David's men and shaves half of their beard off. Say, embarrassed. He made their face bare, their spirit. So he shaves half of their beard off and he cuts their clothing off at the hip. Say, embarrassed. And he makes them walk back to David, of course naked from the waist down, and half of their beard shaved off. And so what David does is he sees these men 
and I strongly suspect David knew that something like that would take place. <laughs> so he sends his men out with a gift, and then the character of this foreign king comes out, and now David has a context to go overtake his territory. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the foreign king's own doing, own doing, because his character was so poor. You see? He didn't worship God. He was an evil, perverse man. And so, <laughs> what does David do with these mighty men, his most trusted men that he sent out and have been abused? Well, he says, wait here in Jericho until your beards have grown back and of course <laughs> I strongly suspect they got another set of clothes where they don't have to walk around with their hind ends showing everywhere they go <laughs> now that's in the word of God the character of Satan is to embarrass someone and so when you are trying to embarrass another person they're serving God and acting in good character toward you, and then you try to embarrass them, you have become a soldier of Satan. That's the truth. And so what do you do about that? <laughs> you don't discourage people that are being kind toward you. That's evil character. That's evil. It doesn't matter what your opinion about them is. If they've done nothing wrong to you and you embarrass them, you try to shave half their beard, or you try to cut off their clothing at the hip and try to expose them and get everybody to laugh and jeer at them, then you're a perverse-minded person. And so, are we condemned to hell when we do that? No, <laughs> not if you repent. No. God forgives sin. But first you have to recognize trying to embarrass people that are acting in good character, that's not right. That's not right. That's an evil act. And God can put His grace on that. And that's what He wants to do when you repent. And so what would lead us to do something like that? Well, people that try to rule by other people's opinions. You know, when you're trying to embarrass someone, what you're trying to do is get everybody to look at them. So you're not valuing what God thinks about that person. You're valuing what people think. And so you're trying to use the power of that to put attention on their embarrassment. You see? There's this thing where <laughs> uh, people, we call it keeping up with the Joneses. Now, most of you will know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> we're worried about what people think about our lives keeping up with the Joneses. So we're constantly comparing our lives to somebody else's. Well, somebody down the street, they have a nice house. Well, these people that live over here, well, they make a lot of money and they have three cars and a $50,000 sports car and yada, 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 yada. All this stuff. And that's just on the outside. That says nothing about their heart. And here, really American culture is heavy, and American Christian culture is heavy into this. They're constantly worried about keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> uh, this family down the street, this family across town, and God looks at that competitive spirit competing in the things of the world and not the things of God, and He looks at that and says, Silly. And you can get in that competitive spirit as well, saying, my ministry's bigger than this one. My ministry's bigger, and God doesn't care. 
God cares about what's in your heart. God cares about what's in your heart. Have you given your heart over to the Lord? Are you acting in religious facade to try to make yourself look superior to the others? Is that your value system? Or do you value what God thinks about you? You see, God cares about your heart. And here is how he saw David and chose David to be king. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, or Eliab, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I had rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 6-7 NIV. And so the context of that scripture passage was that Samuel had been sent to anoint a person as king over Israel. And he walks up and this guy he sees, Eliab, <laughs> he looks at him and says, Surely this is the guy I've come to anoint. <laughs> well, God corrects him. Now I'm looking at the inside. You see, Samuel looks at a man and says, That's a tall, good-looking fella. Surely that's the king of Israel. And God's going, No. I'm looking at a person's heart. That's what I care about. That's not the guy you're here to anoint. <laughs> so when we start looking on the outside, we've become shallow in the things we value most. What matters to God and what should matter to us when we align our thinking with the Lord's is what's on the inside of a person. That's what matters. The opinions of men when they're looking at each other and evaluating each other, that's shallow business. What matters is what God created you to do and what God created that other person to do. That's what matters to the Lord. You see, when we become infatuated with people's opinions about us, we've adopted a value system that is perverse in the eyes of God. What real spirituality is about is about purifying your spiritual house, your heart, before the Most High. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No. A person, who, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Romans 2, 28-29 in IV. And so there it is. There's the gospel to the Romans. Circumcision is not merely an outward thing. Circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God. So when we submit ourselves to the Lord and say, God, purify what's in my heart, He will cut off all fleshliness, <laughs> our flesh nature, until we were pure. We are pure in heart. We're living by the Spirit and not by fleshly desires of man. You see? That person's praise, that person's praise is from the Lord. Man's opinion matters little to God <laughs> or nothing. You see, real praise that matters comes from the Lord. What does He think about you? 
I want to talk about the torture of false pretenses. Now, let me explain what I mean. When we become infatuated with our image in the eyes of man, what do people see when they're looking at me and looking at my life? We become uh, infatuated with that and we try to maintain that image. And so all your life, you spend all your time trying to make more money, have a bigger house. <laughs> what do people think about me when I go in church? Well, am I helping enough with the children's church? or Who cares? You've become infatuated with what people think about you rather than what God thinks about you. If God tells you to do something, do it. That's it. God's got things for you to do. However, when you become infatuated with what people think about you rather than what God thinks about you, it totally sidetracks things because God's got some things that He wants you to focus on, but you're too infatuated with what man thinks. So now you're spending all your time maintaining that image you're projecting rather than serving the Lord. You see, and there's torture in that. Because in the eyes of man, there's all this competitiveness. And when you look at somebody else and see that they're better than you, based on a value system that's shallow, you think, oh, well, I want what they've got. It's like covetousness. I want what they've got. Their house is better. Their family's better. Their situation in life is better. And so you spend all that time thinking about that, trying to measure yourself against other people according to false metrics. But there's torture in it because there's always somebody better than you are according to that way of measuring a man, which is perverse but common. And so you look at somebody else's situation and think, wow, that's so good. And see, there's torture in that. Because it makes you feel low. <laughs> see, Adam and Eve were looking down. Say, lowly. So, <laughs> you can get so caught up in what other people think about you that I've seen people eat their meals. They're so infatuated with what other people see in them. They're so infatuated with projecting this certain image of refined character. <laughs> They're sitting here. They're not really worried about what God thinks about them. They're holding their fork in a certain way. They can't even enjoy their meal. They're so worried about what people are thinking about them. They're sitting there trying to use the correct fork and hold it with their posture just so and scooping and and, and I'm not making fun. I'm just talking about look at the pleasure and enjoyment of life that is wasted because people are sitting there worried about how they look. You see, there is torture in that when you start worrying about what other people think. And you volunteer for it when you think that way. That's not the will of God. That's not the will of God. You were made with a purpose and a character by the Most High. What other people think about you matters nothing. It doesn't. You see, Pharisees worry about what people think. The opinion of man is what they value and how they ruled. Let me explain. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, 
they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Matthew 6, 5-6 through 6, NIV Do you see the stark contrast in value system between what the Pharisees valued and what Jesus values? He says, go into your room and close the door. Who cares what anybody else sees? Pray to your Father. What does God think about you and what's your relationship like with Him? That's what matters. Now the Pharisees are out supposedly serving God, but they don't even get. They have no idea what they're doing. They're standing on the street corner. Oh, merciful Father, Thou art mighty. What are they doing? It's a false pretense. It's a facade. It's an image they're trying to project to the public. They're using the context of prayer to make it look like they're holy. But they're out there doing it because of what men think, not because they love the Lord. You see? So when Jesus comes along and makes them look bad, they want to kill Him. That's what motivated the Pharisees. Get rid of this guy that's making us look bad. They didn't care about serving God. They care about how it looked in the eyes of men. That's why they hated Jesus. So that's Caiaphas. Caiaphas thought it would be good to kill Jesus. Why? To maintain the status quo. To maintain how people saw their system of religiosity. The temple system. See, Jesus was saying things that screwed up their system, so (laughs) screwed up their image in the eyes of the masses. So they decided to kill him. Do you value your image to the extent that you would commit character assassination? Wow. That's the heart of Caiaphas. You see, how the Pharisees ruled was by public opinion. You see, even when they were having a trial, Jesus was being evaluated and they couldn't find anything wrong with Him. So since they couldn't find anything wrong with Him, how did they get Him crucified anyway? Well, there was a crowd of people saying, Crucify, crucify, crucify. What is that? Public opinion. Public opinion crucified Christ and we live by it all the time. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and it is perverse. Perverse thinking. You see, when we become afraid of what other people think, we betray those we love. Isn't that what happened to Peter? Now, Jesus told Peter ahead of time, you're going to go out and deny me three times. Oh no, oh no, I wouldn't do that, Master. And then Peter goes out and he's motivated by fear of what people think. So they ask him, are you one of those disciples of Jesus? No, no, that's not me. Why did he do that? Why did he lie? Because he cared too much about what people thought. And so he betrayed the King of Kings. And he did it three times. When you start worrying about people and what they think, it causes you to commit acts of perverse character that cannot be exaggerated. That's the substance of hell. And even so, Jesus said, I've prayed for you, Peter. Peter walks into grace because of the love of Jesus. And you see, he got that out of his character. What other people were saying. And then he carried the gospel. 
If we're going to walk in the power of God and the character of Christ, we must stop thinking what other people think about us. We must stop uh, evaluating what other people think about us. Who cares? Who cares? When you start cycling that stuff through your mind, you've given your temple over to something that is not of God. When you start thinking about what other people say, their opinions, you see? What is the Word of God? That should be in your temple. What does God think about you? What's the covenant promise of God for you? That's the Spirit of the Most High. Satan rules by public opinion that puts a perverse idea in their minds about what right looks like. Here's Jesus standing before them, flawless, and they want to hang Him on a tree, drive nails in His hands, His wrists, brutalize Him. Why? Because their mind is perverse. The opinions of man are easily confused. What matters is what God thinks about you and what God thinks about other people. God's opinion overrules anybody else's. And <laughs> the funny thing is, the moment you pass into eternity, that's all that will matter, what God thinks about you. That's it. You can't take your money with you. You can't take all your fans with you. You can only take the relationship that you have with the Most High. How did you live your life? Did you live it for God? Did you love Him and serve Him? That'll be what you take with you. And so this is how Paul thought. Paul, <laughs> now think about Paul's history. Paul started out stoning Christians because he thought he was doing a good job. And it was, according to public opinion that they did it, they would get a group that all agreed with, <laughs> with Paul. These Christians, they're crazy. So let's, as a group, say public opinion, a majority rules, let's all pick up a rock and bash this Christian in the head with a rock. We'll do it as a group. And Paul was one of the ringleaders of that craziness <laughs> until Jesus confronts it and says, Paul, on the road, says, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> Paul thinks he's doing good and he's bashing the Lord's servants in the head with a rock. Man, you talk about being messed up. And so... Paul gets his character transformed to where he doesn't think about what man thinks about him, but he only thinks about what God says about him. And he carries the gospel. And he wrote the Pauline epistles, which stand <laughs> as foundational documents for the Christian faith. That man is who God used. Because he changed the way Paul thought. And this is what Paul said. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 4, 3 NIV. You see? Now we're not to depart from the Apostles' doctrine. Here's the Apostle Paul saying... Who cares what even a human court says? <laughs> Why? It's influenced by public opinion and not by the opinion of God. It's supposed to be ruled by righteousness, but guess what? It's not. That's the reality. Paul says, who cares what anybody says about me? I don't even evaluate myself. I don't even judge myself. So what's he saying? Paul's saying, what I think about me doesn't even matter. <laughs> What God thinks about me and what He says about me is all that matters. I look at myself, well, that's a human opinion. Who cares? What do you say, God? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what 
what God thinks about you, that's all that matters. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, <laughs> you've got to understand, this story is in Daniel 3, and you can read it if you want, but most people know about this story, and it's three men that won't bow to an image. Now listen to me. They will not bow to an image. And you've got to imagine this scene. Nebuchadnezzar has said, you will bow to this image or I will throw you in a fire, kill you. And so there's three men and everybody else is bowing to this image. You see, the public opinion is you better bow to that image. There's masses around and they're all bowing to the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And these men of character say, no, we're not bound to that image. And so they're thrown into the fire, the place of great pressure. If you don't bow, I'll attack you. And they say, no. No, go ahead. The Lord is able to deliver us. And so they're thrown into the fire. And one that looks like a son of the gods is in the fire with them. Say, thank you, Jesus. That's what happens when people attack you. Jesus will enter into your situation and He will protect you, not by man's means, but by the means of the Most High. What man thinks about you when you refuse to bow to the image that man worships and you, ref you free refuse to dishonor the Lord that you serve and you serve Him and stand for Him, the covenant of Christ will save you. That's right. <laughs> Honor the Lord your God. That's what matters. That's it. And so... We have to change what motivates us. What motivates us? Is it fear or is it love? Is it fear or is it love? Do we fear what man thinks? And is that what causes us to make decisions in life? Or do we say, Oh, God loves me. That's what's going to drive me. We've got to stop paying attention to the facade that we put up because that's not what matters. What matters is what's in your heart. That's what God's looking at. And so, <laughs> grace upon grace to the people of God that we can stop paying attention to what man thinks about us and start paying attention to what God thinks about us. Let me pray for you. <laughs> God, we love you. I ask that the people listening to this message would change their value system to what the Most High God thinks about them. You were made with a purpose and you are who God says you are. What other people say about you matters not. What other people say about the servants of God matters not. Because the Lord Most High reigns over all. And so, Father God, I ask this new value system about what God thinks and says about the people, that's what matters. Let us lay the opinions of man down and let us take up the word of the Lord and plant it in our hearts until our minds are filled with it and our temple is filled with the word of the Lord and the glory of the Most High breaks out and destroys every work of darkness in us and around us. Let the people of God shine with the glory of the Lord upon them. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen.
God bless you. <laughs> I encourage you to check out my new book, The Power Cycle of Creation, A Wheel-Driven Vehicle. This is a spiritual journey exploring the perspectives of God toward all of creation, Christian culture, mankind, and time itself. Go to SovereignRoar.com to learn more. On the website, you can also sign up to receive the Judah Watch monthly by email. This is an apostolic commentary on Christian culture and newsletter format. This has been an episode of the Paradigm Shift Weekly. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a new episode of the Paradigm Shift, a weekly video series produced by Sovereign Roar. Sovereign Roar is the apostolic marketplace ministry of Matthew Shoemaker.